Thank you again for joining our uh, celebration of World Oceans Week. World Oceans Day was last Monday, June 8th, and it was a chock full day of uh, great things. And that has extended into uh, World Oceans Week. And we're actually gonna go even beyond a single week with uh, some events that will be uh, happening next week and even throughout the year. I know uh, Climate Creatives and at Future Frogmen, uh, this is what we do day in and day out. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Tuesday we had a workshop. Susan instructed us how her project works and how uh, uh, people can uh, uh, map and identify in local landmarks, local locations, uh, how the sea is predicted to rise in the coming years and decades. So we're gonna review that today and then we're gonna actually look at uh, at least one project that came out of Tuesday's instruction. So we'll be talking more about that in, uh, in a little bit. But again, Susan Israel is the founder and president of Climate Creatives and Rising Waters. And my name is Richard Hyman and I'm the founder and president of Future Frogmen. And I'd like to just tell you briefly about what we do. We foster ocean ambassadors and future leaders. We welcome people of all ages. Uh, most of our traction is with students. We are therefore student focused, primarily at the undergraduate and graduate college and university level, as well as in high schools. And we strive to connect people to water through education, action, and exploration. We, we pride ourselves, we feel very strongly about being inclusive. Uh, I published a letter last week based upon uh, events that have occurred and uh, we actually postponed our Wednesday event this week uh, associated with World Oceans Week due to the STEM walkout. And we're gonna, uh, we rescheduled that to uh, next Wednesday. And uh, Hallie, who will be on today's call, actually is gonna be moderating that uh, great panel that's gonna be talking about how climate change is impacting marine species. Yesterday, we had a great blue economy workshop uh, uh, and, uh, and here we are today with part two of sea level rise. We are a volunteer based organization. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please check out our website, futurefrogmen.org and there under connect, you can subscribe to our newsletter we put out a weekly newsletter. We try not to send too many emails, just a weekly newsletter, and we hope you'll subscribe. And also, if you like podcasts, check out our new Blue Earth podcast. If you search for that on your favorite podcast platform, you can find us there. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Susan. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this has been uh, a wonderful project working with future frogmen and um, I'm extremely excited about today's workshop. Uh, this has been a really fun week. There's been amazing stuff. A lot of it's recorded if you go to the website and um, uh, I'm excited that you're here to learn more about the oceans and how we can advocate for it through art and communicate data through art. So Future Frogman has been amazing to work with. It's been an absolute delight and I look forward to doing more with them and really happy to have met Richard and Hallie and, and put these two programs together. So uh, I'm the, the uh, founder and president of Climate Creatives and the way that that happened was I was an architect for 20 years and I would put choices in front of people who were green and more sustainable. They'd be sustainable materials or methods and I found that um, people were just really not that interested. They weren't motivated, they weren't connected to the issue of climate change, and there was no, no emotional or cultural commitment to it. And so at that point, I decided that I could potentially have a better impact on the climate by working on behavior change and culture change. And I also recognized that at that point, we had so much data. This was um, over 10 years ago, really 2008 was when I started working on this concept. We had the data, we had the science, it was perfectly clear and it was, and it was easy enough to hear, you, you would stumble across it, you didn't have to look for it and people didn't care. And I thought we really need to try to reach people some other way. And 
with a background in art and design and architecture, I felt like we could really connect through visual arts and through making art. And so I started Climate Creatives exactly to do that. Uh, it's evolved a little bit over time. And, and I will talk a little bit more about Climate Creatives, but um, I'm going to jump right into Rising Water since that's what you came for. Um, I will just say this about Climate Creatives is that we have two ways of working and one is in, in workshops and making art and the other is in public art. And so one of the public art projects that um, has really taken off and captured people's imagination is Rising Waters. Rising Waters shows where future flood levels will be in the landscape due to all different factors added up. And it can be from freshwater flooding, which is uh, when it's on rivers known as riverine flooding or ocean flooding. And so it will be um, sea level rise, storm surge, rainfall, king tide, which is the highest tide. And if it's riverine flooding, it will just be river flooding and rainfall, or if there are some other local factors. And just to show you a couple of projects of how it's been done in the past, the most recent project that we did was in Fort Lauderdale, which you all may know is on limestone and the water actually is coming up through the ground. Um, it's different from a lot of other locations because of that and it's a much fiercer problem for them. They can't defend from just water offshore. So I did an installation of rising waters at the Museum of Discovery and Science where they had, in, they had um, a student summit on sea level rise for 800 students and we installed it at the museum. These are just some quick shots and we'll get some more detail later about how and why you can use different materials to install it in when you do it on site. They also use fish flags. I did workshops with the students to show them how to install it in their schools for Earth Day this year and 30 schools are ready to go with the materials and the instructions and they're all set and then we had COVID of course so everything shut down. So that will happen someday in the future. And we had uh, the, the director of that project who, who brought me down to Broward County was on Tuesday saying that they are still waiting to do it and may do digital installations. So when this all happened, we had been wanting to, be, to, to have a digital alternative. This was kind of our opportunity. And, um, and so we started, uh, just laying out the steps to make it accessible to everybody else. A couple of other projects I'll show you quickly. This is um, a school in Hong Kong where high school students installed rising waters. They shared it with the student assembly. They sent information home to the families and so they used it as a platform to engage their entire school community around sea level rise and storm threats. And they had had a typhoon in September. This was in January. Uh, 20, 2019, and they had had a typhoon recently enough that people were really quite concerned about, um, about flooding. So we also, um, I went and worked with some middle school students in Hong Kong, and we did a workshop that connected their own art making to uh, sea level rise and rising waters installations. And I had also done that down in Panama. I'm showing you some of the more fun places that I've done it. This is on the uh, San Blas Islands, known by the local name as Cunayala. These are coral atolls that will disappear soon. They've already started working on evacuating the families. There are about um, 350 islands. Not all of them are inhabited though. And uh, I think, uh, 40,000 people, I think, who will have to move off of these islands because you can see here, they're already getting water on the streets in October at their highest tides, and that's without a storm. So they are barely above sea level here, maybe eight inches um, at the high point. <clears throat> so same thing, I went down, I did a community installation with the uh, residents there, and then I did a workshop with the students an art workshop that was a response piece, just showing where the fish will be in the future. And one thing that I always do on the installations, you can see here is show the different dates. It's very clear on last year's Rising Waters installation on the Peace Boat. Uh, we like everyone to show the dates, to use accurate data 
and this is with the uh, the director of the peace boat and show the different years right on the whatever kind of markers you use right now we're using we like everyone to use these 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 three colors as warning colors and the decade at which this is projected because this is really about communicating data so i'm going to stop talking now um, and just go to uh, one more project which is whoops sorry it's hiding i have to move this there we go which is the one that we're going to talk about next. And uh, I'm really thrilled that Hallie showed up and has participated and um, has been really wonderful on this project um, coming on Tuesday and turning this around so that we could get it up on the website. So Hallie, if you would like to, I'm gonna stop sharing and give you the screen. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, and Hallie is gonna present from here. Okay, so I think I'm sharing now. And we will, I'm going to mute in a moment, but we will be going over how Hallie found this data, the different websites after she presents. Yeah, so I uh, attended the workshop on Tuesday and followed the steps to get all of these different measurements. Um, I explored a few other sites first, but they weren't as exciting, so I ended up choosing downtown Mystic, Connecticut, which is near where I am. Um, and I found that the elevation of the site of the street itself is 10 feet. And then I um, looked up the mean higher high water and mean sea level. And then also what sea level rise is expected to be in 2030, 2050, and 2070. Um, so just to show you how I calculated some things, um, First, I calculated that the site is 6.95 feet above the mean higher high water, um, which is what these projected sea level rises are calculated from. So from there, I could just subtract that value from each of those expected rises to calculate how high the water will be on my site. So in 2030, the water will be five inches above my site. In 2050, it will be two feet, three inches, and then 2070, is four feet, 10 inches. So I was trying to find a picture of downtown Mystic that I could use and remember that I just snapped this image actually last week. So there's this whale statue outside of the local bookstore and right now they have it um, with a face mask because we're obviously in a pandemic. Um, so I thought this would be a cool location to show those um, sea level heights on, but at first I wasn't sure how I was going to measure the statue without actually being there to measure in person. Um, but then I got the idea of using the standing ashtray next to the whale. Um, I looked up the product on Google and found the dimensions, so I was able to use the height of the product to create a scale in um, ImageJ, which is a software you can use to make measurements on images. And I was also um, able to then render the, the different heights using the three stripes on it that way, trying to make it as accurate as possible. So then this is the final product. Um, I was really surprised at actually how high it will be in 2070. So this is um, four feet, 10 inches. And I was like, that makes sense because I'm five one and I was like, about that height when I was standing next to the whale statue. So I think it's pretty accurate. Um, and I like how it came out. I don't know if anyone has any questions right now. Well, um, we'll come back for Q and A. So if anybody thinks of any questions, um or at any point chime in um <clears throat> but um that's fantastic hallie um it's it's so cool i love the image that you chose to put it on the whale with the mask is of the moment and mm -hmm. kind of whimsical and really interesting and 
your process is wonderful. I love the fact that you found something in the landscape that you could scale off of and you took that extra step to do the research and get the product information. Um, and it's a great image. You did a fantastic job. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to add about that, about the process or how you felt about it? You, you know, you told us you sort of surprised at the height. Anything mm -hmm. else that you wanted to talk about? Um, it was actually pretty easy to gather all the data and calculate everything. Great. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, so, oh, there's a question on chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what was the name of the app and the sof software used to create a scale on an image? Yeah, it's called Image J, and I believe it's free. I already had it downloaded um, before, but I believe it's a free. Okay. And software. is that on Android or Apple? You know. Yeah, I have it on Apple, but I think it's also available for, um, it's on my computer. So I think it also works on PC. Okay, great. All right. Um, so we'll go back and I'm going to actually show you all the sites. Um, Hallie, did you use the sites that we had talked about on Tuesday? Yeah, I looked at them for examples to make sure I was getting the right numbers. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go back through the process um, in case you weren't there on Tuesday and also because I kind of rushed it and uh, I'm not quite sure that anybody really could have followed what I was saying, to be honest. So um, what I've done is put everything into slides that will be living on the website here. If you go to uh, our website, um, Rising Waters, and up here at the top, you go to Rising Waters Digital. And from there, here are the slides. Uh, download the slides from United Nations World Oceans Day workshop with future frogmen. And that will give you all of the sites that you need and step by step, uh, you can walk through it. So um, I'm just gonna show you what it looks like and then go through the process uh, without probably going back and forth. Um, so the basic process is you have to identify a site uh, you have to find the find an image of the site if you can't take one. Find the data for that site, and then render the water on whatever it is—a building, landscape, monument. Um, show the dates on the lines. Please use that yellow, orange, red because it's a key that people come to recognize, and it kind of ties all of the different projects together. And then, but you know, in this case, you might render the water as well. You might just have some fun with it and decide that there's something else you might want to put fish on. It's just good to have this sort of those colors tied to those dates. Show the dates. The dates that I use are 2030, 2050, and 2070, because when you go too far out, people say, well, that doesn't matter, it's not relevant. Um, 2020 feels a little bit close and people may not believe it until they actually see a storm. 2030, that's in, in the near term, people, people can identify with that. And a lot of municipalities use 2070 as their furthest out date for planning, for flooding. So, and then 2050 obviously gives you the middle. Um, signage, please put some signage up. Um, if you do this out in the landscape, this is left over from doing it out in the landscape, but eventually we'll come out of this but always credit others if you have somebody else's work involved with that, of course. And then if you wanna create an action campaign, whether it's an image or, or a, you know, an in-person installation, creating this digitally means that you have the media that you can really start to blast this out through your media channels um, and do a do one thing campaign. So uh, that's uh, one with a numeral. And then we'll collect those hashtags. Um, if you want to learn some of the things that you can suggest that people do or help share it, we have a resources page on, actually, it's on Rising Waters as well as Climate Creatives. There's a resource page that tells people what they can do and then obviously share it out. Um, the other thing is talk about climate change, the oceans, and the human impacts because data research has shown that when people talk about climate change, there is more action, more people get committed to it and get on board with it. And the oceans are a kind of niche. It's a little surprising, but most people don't think about the oceans. 
And when you start to show what's going on on most of the, the, the surface of the earth, um, even though it's underwater, it's, it's quite shocking, I think, to a lot of people to learn about it. So um, the other thing is make sure you vote, tell people to vote, and um, help people remember that their choices matter. So the first thing that um, we'll do when we calculate the sea level rise, one thing about data is there is, there is no such thing as um, a sea level. There, there's mean sea level, uh, low tide, high tide, there's sort of mean high, high water, mean low water. So you want to know what your datum are so you have more precise predictions of what will happen. And you want to collect flooding from all sources and add them up. Now there is a shortcut because Climate Central does that for us. And then as Haley, Haley did, you subtract your site elevation from the flood water elevation so that uh, your you're showing it relative to the land where, where you're, you've selected a site. And then you add them all up and, and we talked about how to do that. So to get into it here, um, the first thing you'll do is you need to find the, whoops, sorry about that. Um, you need to find the elevation for your site. So there's something and these links are all on the slides in order. So first you're going to, and then when they're on the slides, um, sorry, there we go. I've tried as much as possible to call them out so you'll be able to find all the little sort of details of how you find something. So you're going to type in um, New York. I'm using uh, Battery Park because that's a very, um, common site and there's a lot of data there. This was, this is an event tied to the UN and so I thought that would be a nice familiar site in New York. So you type it in, that pops right up. Now in this case, um, there actually are a few different sites, sorry, on this map and I was trying to choose one which is 10 feet. Um, this is 16. The first time I did it was 10 feet and then if you just move over a little bit you know, it's 13 feet uh, down here, right here, seven feet if you go over to South Street. And so the one that I used was 10 feet. Um, it's not coming up, but that's okay. There's seven feet. So these can be, these elevations can be quite um, finely tuned. So I picked 10 feet and I'll show you just a way to organize your information in a sketch that I have on the slides is uh, sort of, I'll, I'll come to that at the end, but there's a way that you can sort of lay it out using my architectural background um, that will show you everything relative to each other, makes it a little easier to understand. So then the next thing that you need to do is you need to find the sea level. So you'll go to this, this is NOAA, it's excellent data, and you're going to click on the state. So I'm clicking on New York because I'm looking for the battery actually. Well, here I could have just typed it. I could have really typed it right in, but I'm going to Battery Park, New York. And here we go, right here, the Battery, New York. It popped up over here. I clicked on that. This comes up and I go up here. I, don't, I hope you can see my, my mouse to more data and you'll go to datums right here. And that will now bring up a graph that shows me relative to the land all of the different uh, datums. Now, NAV, there's something, there are different GIS systems. There's LIDAR, there, uh, there are different ways of finding elevations. It's a lot trickier than XY coordinates. So across the United States, uh, we use uh, NAV D88. Um, I think it's navigational datum from 1988 is what it's short for. And um, most all of the oceans things are going to be relate are going to be relating to those those datum. So I'm going to look um, the station if I sorted by nav d88 that it would come up as zero. So I need to look for 
for two data because when I went to this site originally and I researched it, I saw that they use mean sea level as their datum for land. So I need to find mean sea level. And here it is, right here, 2.57. Then I also know because I researched it at Climate Central, if you sort of dig down, it's in there, they use mean high, mean higher high water as their datum. So you're going to need to reconcile uh, the discrepancy on that, and I'll show you how to do that in the diagram. So you need to take those two figures. So my mean high or high water is five feet, 5.05 feet. Uh, that We went through that and we went through that. Then I go to Climate Central because that now I know where my land is relative to the water, basically relative to high tide. But now I need to know where uh, flooding, the, the increase in sea level due to storm surge and sea level rise. And Climate Central is an amazing tool. The data is from NOAA. They work with NOAA. And it's, it, it, it's extremely, um, I want to say a better word than reputable, but it's highly, highly regarded. And um, by using this, they've already done a lot of that adding up of all of the different factors. It may not actually have rainfall in it, but it's, they, they just do uh, flooding all in. Things are kind of hidden. So you're going to come to this. It's going to look like this. You have to scroll down. And right here, it says program on sea level rise. So you click on that. And you'll come here. And then you'll, have, you'll click on risk finder and map on the right. This is actually a slider, so sometimes it comes up. But if you click on it here, then Right here, risk finder and map, you can put in uh, New York. Here we go. And go to New York. Now, one thing about this, and there are many different maps and many different tools, and it's kind of fun to look at them, but this is the one, this is the one place where you'll be able to find sea level rise, the flooding levels. Um, in different decades with the decades noted. You always need to check your assumptions when you're working with this kind of data. So right here, if you go in this setting, it's a little hidden. You can choose which model they've used because there's a ton of research that's gone into this website. I always use, here's sea level rise on the top of the first one, sea level rise and height of extreme flood. Because one thing that we've learned over the past five years um, is that we have outstripped every sea level rise and every flood prediction every year. Um, unfortunately, the news is, excuse me, unfortunately, the news is getting worse and worse. Um, we are at risk of losing enormous pieces of Arctic ice and, and with the methane that's, you know, all the methane that's escaping in the Arctic, um, the news has not been good. And so these sea level rise models have been, I'm sure you've seen it in the news, have been revised upward year after year. This gives you, you can choose by model um, because there are, everybody's doing different models. So if you want to do it that way, you can. And then you select a water station. And this one actually is because I typed it in, it's at the battery. And there are five different stations around the New York area. So sea level rise, and storm surge is not the same uniformly. When people think of three feet of sea level rise or 12 feet of sea level rise, they're thinking of but across the globe. That's not true, it's very local. It can be different um, 10 miles away from each other. So you really have to look and um, look at a station that is near where your site is. So then you go to that. Now we have other datum we can choose. We can, uh, you know, slow, uh, medium, fast, and extreme. Again, I choose extreme because that is the path that we are on. And so let's use that. And so now I have 2030 is 7.9 feet. 2050 is 9.7 feet. And 2070 is 12.4 feet. Um, all right, so we did that. We did that. I just had queued some of these up and I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so going back to the slides, um, this is what I was, this is what we just went through. It's all 
all, all the different locations are highlighted so you can find them, they're circled. And now we have our numbers. So we have the levels by decade above mean high, high water, that's the datum they use, and um, the site, which is five feet above mean high, high water. And I calculated that by looking at, by subtracting that. Uh, I, I did that from the, uh, the first datum that we got relative to, to mean sea level. And so as Haley did, I subtracted the site elevation, and then that gave me the actual elevation above grade. So the total level for the C is 7.9 feet, minus 5.05 feet is the height of the land, which gives me roughly three feet. And again, you have to translate um, your inches, your feet into inches, 9.7 feet is not nine feet, seven inches. Sometimes people forget to do the conversion and they're a few inches off. So that's uh, four feet, eight inches and seven feet, four inches above grade in 2070. And one of the things you might think about when you're doing a real installation is can I actually reach that? Or maybe with digital, it'll be fun to do an installation that you can't reach in real life. So you can put this all together in a diagram if that makes it easier for you and show this is NAVD 88. This is mean sea level. This is where mean high, high water is. That's, that was from the first chart that we looked at. And then you can see the different levels of sea level rise here of, of flooding. And then you go across and take out the difference of the land, essentially. And you get to the, the difference right here, which is the level, the height of the lines, uh, or however you're going to install it. And one other kind of fun, um, climate create uh, uh, climate central site is uh, this newest latest greatest um, this is all the latest data it came out about two months ago it's kind of terrifying you can adjust by all different factors but it's interesting to just go you can take any site in the US they have some sites around the world and you can change your assumptions and look at it in different ways and so that's uh, extremely useful. Um, I'm going to stop for the moment and take questions at this point. Um, does anybody have questions about what we just went over? Does any, oh, and then the last thing I want to say is once you do all of this, uh, you, on our website we have an upload portal right here so that you can um, upload your, your images, this is how, how Haley sent it to me. Um, you just type everything in and send your images. There's a, there's a file size limitation just to be aware of. So I'm going to, um, if there aren't any questions. Susan, I had a couple of questions. Um, I was curious, um, really questions for Haley, but relate to, to your whole program, Susan. Uh, one was, uh, Hallie, did you go through the process that Susan just did? Did you go through that entirely or did you, or were there any variations? Uh, no, I went through it um, following the same steps. I actually, yeah, followed from the PowerPoint. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and, uh, and how did that go for you? Um, was it, how long did it take you and, and was it difficult or was it fun? No, it was fun, um, and it didn't take too long. What actually took the longest was that I had chose some other sites before, and when I actually did the calculations, they weren't, the sea level rise wasn't gonna be as high um, as I wanted to make something impactful. So I landed on the Mystic, Connecticut, and I liked how that looked, yeah. Yeah, no, that was a good, uh, as Susan noted, that was a good spot to pick, very, very mm -hmm. cool. I guess my last question, uh, Hallie was going through that experience. Um, you may have just touched upon this about picking a location, but did, did you have any tips for, for people that are viewing this, that how they might uh, go about it? Anything you learned, any, any tips? Um, so some locations, you can't actually get the tide information from that specific location. So you have to choose the nearest site. Um, so for me in Mystic, there's a tide gauge in New London, I think, which is pretty nearby. 
um, but some locations you might have to look farther out. So just keep that in mind. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'd love to have this be more of a conversation. Um, I'm curious sort of who's in the audience and what brought you here. I'm happy to talk about, uh, you know, the in-person um, installations that we've done and talk about kind of the different ways that we've shown it and materials and methods. But I'm also curious to hear, you know, from anybody in the audience who's, if you're thinking about doing this or what brought you here or, or uh, anything else. I am definitely excited to um, do this. I have, I live in Southern California and um, Encinitas is a beach town and I think I will go over there and find and find something to measure. I think it would, it's a fun activity to do and also bring awareness. So I'm very excited to do this. it will be very fun. Thank you. That's great. I'm excited to hear that. Uh, yeah, and definitely use our upload portal. We'll put it, put it up there and um, and then you can share that out too. But it is, it's a great, it's a great awareness tool. Um, one of the things that we'd like to add to it is people's stories. So um, just feel free to chime in if you have something to say. Uh, but I'm going to just talk a little bit about if you, and one thing to think about when you're doing this digitally you, you can kind of have a flight of fancy because you can do anything you want that you wouldn't be able to do if you are out there really trying to do it physically. But some, but I'll just talk about if this is, you can even think of this as preparation uh, for after COVID. Or, you know, if you can go out there and it's a safe site without, well, you know, having to get close to people, you could do an installation any time really and then it's it, this is kind of in a funny way we're doing it digitally but this is one of the few things that is a covid safe activity um, because you do it you can do it on your own and uh, or somebody from your household and and then just leave it um, and you might not even really have to get permission to the extent that you normally would if buildings are closed although things are opening up one of the issues is um, building owners don't like an expiration date on their building and that's that's kind of what this is so it can be very difficult unless it's a university or a museum or some public institution or a very um, enlightened building owner. It can be very hard to get permission. And one of the things we found also is that nobody really wants you to put paint on their building. So the first thing I did was paint. It was an old pier. It didn't really matter. It was going to wash away. And then uh, the next thing that I did, I'll show you some of these installations because um, it's sort of fun to see the, the evolution of materials, is um, just taking a little while to load because I have so many windows. So the very first thing I did was here, Harbor Arts, and that was painting an old pier, which uh, tw that was 2013, and you can see the lines across here. At that point, I was showing one foot per level of sea level rise because the prediction for 2100 is three to six feet. We are so exceeding that, it's stunning. And this pier has pretty much 50% uh, or more washed away since then because of storms. You can see the, the lines here. We also paired it with um, a Tell Me, a message in a bottle project where we asked people to respond and put their messages in. We had some small bottles around the site as prompts. And um, so that kind of, public engagement and call and re call and response if you want to put you know a hashtag or a way for people to contact you or post something to you know your twitter handle or something on the site there are ways to engage the public even if you're not there and that can be a lot of fun or even if you're doing it digitally and then you're posting it you can start a dialogue and um, these are some of my volunteers who helped me install peter fell in the water with his car key and his phone in his pocket that was uh, kind of an unfortunate event. So then I used um, plastic. The next one was uh, Maverick Square. And this was a storm preparedness campaign for the community. So we showed where flood level would be if Sandy had hit at high tide. Boston missed Sandy by five, five hours or five and a half hours. And so if it had just hit at high tide, this is the kind of flooding that we would have seen in East Boston and in other places in Boston. 
And uh, so this was made with high school students in East Boston, uh, a teen workforce group. And then there was a public, we put in a public information campaign. This was in the health center, which is next to it on the same site. And it was really beautiful, but it did, um, it didn't show as much data, it turns out, you know, it just didn't show as much information and, uh, and we used plastic to make it last. And I reclaimed the plastic. It was garbage when I found it. It was uh, sort of over, over, overage, but plastic. And I also used um, these plastic stickers was sort of the next iteration in Provincetown, but just the visuals of plastic in an oceans project and the risk in this case that it could fall in the water um, was really so contrary to working with oceans that um, these were sort of a laminated process to make these stickers, which stayed up for a number of years, um, that um, I started to evolve it to different methods. And so we ended up at the end of the day saying, you know what, fabric is a good solution. So Hong Kong, Panama, and uh, Broward County, we used fabric in Broward County. I'll show you a little bit more detail of, of that one. Um, whoops. Uh, uh, there's also one more before I jump onto that, the fish flags, which are um, these sort of go into the ground if you don't have any building surface to attach them to. And you can do messaging on that too. People can take them with them. It's very temporary, in out. This is left over from a beach party the night before at a conference in San Diego on uh, Paradise Island. And so of course we took them with us when we left, but um, it's a nice temporary event-based solution. And again, this was the, this is a, another way that we showed it, which was relative to sort of absolute levels of sea level rise without storm surge and not relative to the site because we were on the eighth deck of the peace boat last year at this same week, UN World Oceans Day and UN World Oceans Week. And we, we couldn't show it on the site. So we showed it relative to the datum in 1992 and then now and then where just sea level rise, 2030, 2050, 2070. And that was pretty shocking um, for people to see. Uh, so stencils are a great way to go, um, whether you use paint or you use fabric. We stencil, we have now been using this burlap fabric because it's 100% jute, natural, uh, all natural materials, and the dye doesn't run if it gets wet. And then we stenciled on the dates we ended up doing, it's a lot more work, but I love this look of police tape, of having the, the dates continuous. Um, it gives it a, a different feeling than, it, than when they're solo. And then when you're on the site, you have to find your levels. So this is the, uh, we actually taped yardsticks to, to the building and then taped uh, string to mark the levels. So everything could sort of be reused and, and there's kind of a nice way of not um, mar leaving marks on the building. This is a, a leave no trace installation. So, uh, and then we just tacked everything into place. Uh, I'll, you know, here are the guide. You can see the strings right here. These are the guidelines. Tacked it all into place, made sure everything was right. And then we came back and we taped it in very firmly, burnished the heck out of everything. And still things fall off very easily. And so you need to really um, make sure whatever materials you're using when you're in on a site are going to be uh, weatherproof. Do a weather test with the tape and whatever you're using and see whether they're going to mar the, the paint below or maybe the site doesn't care at the museum. They said they could just paint it over, but, but it didn't. Um, and then signage, of course, you always want to credit anybody you're working with and say what your assumptions are. So um, you could use a QR code, you could use a URL, but if you have the opportunity to use signs, it's a lot more immediate. People tend to walk by and either they see it and they read it or they keep going. And then you document it, share it, uh, social it out. So that's kind of the, the, the end of the formal part um, of what I was going to say. My, you know, you can reach me through um, the website. Here's my URL and the URL of the website. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about climate creatives or rising waters if anybody's interested. Um, but I'm going to uh, keep that up for another minute and then go back to 
go back to faces. So you can take that down and it's also on the website. So if, um, did anybody have any other questions about what we're doing or um, climate creatives or using art for advocacy, oceans advocacy, art for oceans advocacy is kind of a big category right now. Uh, what are you thinking? Thanks, Susan. So I'm a student at Southern in New Haven, and since we're right on the shoreline here, I think it's a good spot. Um, I might be able to find, I don't know if anyone on here is actually from Yale, but there's another, there's a couple of student groups at Yale too that would probably get involved. And if Southern, that university is unfortunately, or fortunately, but also unfortunately, is up raised elevation, but Yale is right down in the middle of town. So that would be an ideal location to do something like this. So. That would be great. Uh, absolutely. If you want to email me and we'll stay in touch, I'd be glad to give any kind of help. And um, it would be terrific to do, you know, as many of these installations as we can, maybe virtually now and real later. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, thank you. yeah, no problem. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you for coming. So, Susan, your your objective is to try to engage with groups around the country, around the world, and uh, guide them on how to do this. Uh, that's your, really, as far as rising waters goes, that's, that's your mission. And then in, in return, you'd like to get the images to, to share. Is that correct? Exactly, yes, that sums it up. I mean, that's, my mission is to get this as many places. And um, now that we, we have this, you know, we, this was actually the first time that we've done workshops online to train people, but it's really the same training process either now when it's digital or later when it's in person. And so we can really scale up through organizations. So if you have a whole organization who wants to do it um, in, you know, maybe they're a hefty flight away halfway around the world, uh, we can do this all virtually. So yes, definitely working with individuals and organizations and, getting these installations done and out there and explaining to people, this is what it looks like because it's really impactful when people see it. And then please send me everything you do because part of this too is to connect everybody together through the Rising Waters website, share everything and have people, they have an opportunity in one place to look at a sa the same markers or the same system in all different locations and see what it looks like Additionally, if you want to send me a video with your story, you know, either writing or in video and your thoughts about the project, about sea level rise, um, how it will affect your community, I'd love to collect those as well because eventually we're hoping to knit together some storytelling around this. So if you can use Future Frogmen and Rising Waters or cl and Climate Creatives, the, our tags, you know, tag us and, um, and hashtag uh, rising waters we'll try to and and the do one thing campaign will you know we'll uh, join in and share those out and and build it uh, between everybody um, the do one thing campaign I think is really important too because sometimes people will look at that and they say well what am I supposed to do with that and so being able to point them to the resource page or, or another resource page someplace with a list of action items, tying that even if you maybe, you know, you post it and then you say, eat less meat, something which is very achievable that everybody can do, especially during COVID, um, that makes them feel like there is a possibility of acting on this because I think that people become very frozen in the face of such an enormous existential problem. And so tying it to action, um, first of all, it answers the naysayers of you just giving us bad information, what am I gonna do with it? And it engages people in the process of actually doing more. Hello, I'm, I'm Yan Ling. Hi, um, I'm actually from Singapore. So it's a tiny island state and it's surrounded by water. And actually earlier this year, um, there was 
um, a documentary by the so like the mainstream media about sea level rise in Singapore, and they also did something quite similar where they mark out a building, but it was via video um, on the sea level rise for Singapore. So um, I think it was good, but the the caveat is that people will have to watch the video to see the whole imagery and look at the extent of rise. So I think like what you're doing, um, be able to share like a snapshot through social media and then engaging more of the community that it's, that brings it um, more relatable to people because people can just see a photo and then straight away say, okay, that's like how high it will rise. And actually I have one question. Have you done like a comparison um, installation where you have maybe like one pillar showing the projection with um, business as usual versus like another installation next to it showing if we reduce you know like our em emissions and then people can see that difference have you done something like that i have thought about that it's a great idea i love that idea and uh, and i've yeah we've uh, thought about doing that or showing different sort of graph lines of different scenarios and i I have to be totally honest. First of all, the simplicity of this is a little easier for people to digest, but I, because I was thinking of doing sort of parallel lines, but I do love the idea. One of the problems though is depending on where you are and most of the places that I've done, that I've looked at it, they're still going to be flooded. Even if we do everything, we're going to be seeing flooding. And then I'm afraid people will look at that and say, well, then it doesn't matter because if it's going to flood anyways, then I may as well do what I want. So you have to be in a site where that is actually going to make a difference. That would be the only caveat with that. Um, but I would love it if you could share the, the link that you were talking about, um, even if it's not in English. Well, it probably is in English from Singapore. Um, and uh, that'd be interesting to see. But yes, I think it's a cool idea. And if you could find a site where there, there would be an improvement with action, then I would love to see that. Thank you. That's the beauty of the telecom though, Susan, can reach such a, a global audience, really. It's fantastic, yeah. This has been really fun, and uh, I'm excited that uh, some people are interested in doing this and sharing it, and uh, once again, I want to thank Haley and Richard, who have been wonderful partners in putting this on. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Richard. Okay, Susan, great. Well, great job. It was really uh, very well done. And uh, so happy to have uh, some return visitors from Tuesday, as well as some new visitors today. And uh, of course, Hallie, it's great that you engaged. I think that added a lot to today that we had, we had somebody uh, that was our intention to have uh, a workshop and and have uh, um, you know have some results to share today. So uh, thank you so much for doing that. And uh, Susan, wonderful job. Um, looking forward to working with you further. And I see a, a lot of uh, potential collaborations. And uh, we would like to help you get the word out. So uh, with that, uh, please check out okay. Susan's website. Uh, uh, Richard, creatives and uh, rising waters and uh, also please check out futurefrogman.org um richard before you click off i just realized there's some questions in chat oh um yes that's from uh Purnima. yeah Purnima. okay you're coming from kerala Kerala, india you got hit by a flood in 2018 and 2019 and the climate experts say that we have to expect flood this year too so whether I'll be able to predict the flood level by following the process I'd mentioned. Well, I mean, that is, that is the, uh, the difficulty is that the, the sea level rise seems to be the flooding is outstripping our models. Uh, and every year they revise it upward. NOAA, the models that I used do some overseas, but sometimes they, um, they do focus more on the United States. So you have to do some local research. When I did Hong Kong, I looked at the Hong Kong Observatory was the best place to find scientific data. And they had a lot of information. They had what I needed. When I was in Panama, I, looked, I called the um, Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute uh, because I could identify them as a reliable 
science organization and they were able to help me with the data. So if you can go to a local university um, and look for more local data and they will know which models uh, apply best, but if, if some of the ones that I gave you don't work. And feel free to email me, I'll, I'll help you try to figure that out. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I would imagine in order to uh, to do what Pornima is trying to do, if, if she had the tool, she would look at that extreme uh, selection that you made, Susan. You showed us, you know, there's multiple selections and you usually use that extreme one for, for present day as well as for down the road. Uh, but uh, uh, we need to see if we can find a, a tool for, for India. Yeah. But uh, what about you, Yenling? Are you aware of a good tool in Singapore that you can use? Hi. Uh, yeah, actually there are a few um, ocean, um, quite oceanographers in Singapore who are trying to map the sea level rise. And there are some projections out there. So, But there are a few models that they base it off. And so I think you have to, yeah, if, if I will to choose a model, I'll see what they actually evaluate it based on and see what would be most visible. Because I've seen several models being done and then some of them project the worst case scenario. And some of them project like um, the 80% prediction so um well some parts of singapore um what i've seen based on the maps um the same areas still get flooded whether it's the worst case scenario or it's just 80 percent um and for the 100 percent um the overshoot um actually it the results are quite drastic because quite a lot of places would be um, that, are, that will be flooded are currently you know um, being populated by people and there are people using those spaces for recreation so I would I would be able to choose but I have to probably decide on like what it is that I want to yeah, look at I think. Mm -hmm. very good thank you for sharing that well, thanks again, Susan and Holly. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I think that concludes uh, today's session, but uh, thank you all and uh, have, a, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. For more information, visit our website at www.futurefrogman.org.